So welcome everyone to the Department of International Development Interrogating Development Seminar Series. This is a bi-weekly event organized by the Department of International Development, Terry King, and we'll drop the program in the chat box so that you can um, see what else we have coming up. Um, so my name is Ingrid Congraven, and I'm co-organizing this seminar series with my colleague, Sudhir Selvaraj, you can see here. Um, and each week we visit a big new book that's pertinent in international development, and we're very excited to open this series with Haroom Akram Lodi, who is Professor of Economics and International Development Studies in the Department of International Development Studies at Trent University in Canada. So trained as an economist, the focus of Haroon's research interest is in the political economy of agrarian change in developing countries, on the economic dimensions of gender relations, and on the political ecology of sustainable rural livelihoods and communities in developing countries. So he's published extensively, including his widely acclaimed book, Hungry for Change, Farmers, Food Justice, and the Agrarian Question. And today he'll be discussing his most recent book that came out late last year, which is the Handbook of Critical Agrarian Studies, which he co-edited co with Christina Diet, Bettina Engels, and Ben McKay. So I'll drop, drop a link in the chat to the book as well. I'm just admitting some more people from the waiting room. Uh, and we're also privileged to have with us today an excellent discussant, Dr. Shilata Sarkar, who is a lecturer in India and Global Affairs here at King's India Institute. And Srilata is trained as an urban geographer, and she re uh, received her doctoral degree from Lund University in Sweden. Uh, with a prior background in history and development studies, her research interests include urban political ecology of South Asia, the politics of caste and infrastructure building, and the political economy of subaltern urbanization. And she's also a contributing writer for Feminism in India. So the title of today's talk, as I'm sure all of you know, is COVID-19 through a critical agrarian studies lens. So Harun will talk to us about his new handbook, but also how it's relevant for understanding the pandemic. And we'll start with Harun and then pass it on to Trilata before giving Harun a chance to respond. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A as well. Um, so do think of questions that you'd like to ask. You'd be welcome to either raise your hand and ask your question live uh, or to drop your question in the chat if you prefer that and we'll pick it up from there. So please keep yourself muted while you're not speaking so that we can hear the speakers clearly. But as I mentioned in the beginning, also, you're welcome to turn your cameras on, which is always nice for the speaker to you know, see who they're talking to. Um, but keep the mics off for now. Um, so that's enough for me. So welcome again. And I'd like to now hand it over to you, Harun. Ingrid, how long do I have to speak? Um, what did I say? 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Yeah. OK. Thank you. OK, well, first, uh, I'd like to uh, start by thanking Professor Alfredo Sadfilo for inviting me to take part in the uh, Interrogating Development Seminar, but also to, uh, to Dr. Ingrid uh, Kavangraven for managing the logistics uh, of today's event. To, this is a pretty special event for me. Um, for a start, it's my first opportunity to present a seminar at King's College, which of course, as most of you should know if you don't, has one of the newest departments of international development anywhere, and holds such great promise, um, which is encapsulated actually in the interrogating uh, development seminar series for this term, where you've got Sakiko Fukuda Par, you've got Jared Gosh, and even in two weeks, Howard French, whose book I'm currently reading. So, I mean, it's, it's quite, a, quite a solid series. It's a shame that our seminar is gonna be over Zoom uh, because I know that we've all suffered from Zoom fatigue and we all miss the in-person experience of seminars. I myself haven't given an in-person seminar since February of 2020. Next slide, please, Ingrid. But this seminar is especially meaningful uh, for me, however, because it's my first opportunity to present my newest co-edited book, Handbook of Critical Agrarian Studies to an audience, co-edited with Christina Dietz, who's uh, in the audience, uh, along with Bettina Engels and Ben McKay. The handbook, uh, we started work on it in May of 2017, and it's been an immense undertaking. We're, in the handbook, we're trying to attempt to define a field that has become attached to a phrase that first started to be used in 2009 by my former student, June Boris, but which has been devoid of precise meaning. And because we're trying to define a field, the result is a handbook of 72 chapters by an international array of scholars and activists that while still incomplete in the breadth of its coverage, 
can serve as the basis by which a generation of graduate students can learn about this field of research, policy, practice, and activism. And please make no mistake about it, part of the rationale behind the handbook is to expose a new generation of graduate students to the agrarian worlds of global development. Doing this is very important to me. More women and men live in rural societies today than at any other time in human history, and they earn an all too often inadequate livelihood, at least in part, from participating in the growing of crops or the tending of livestock or overseeing forests, very often supplemented by irregular waged labor. Indeed, when we think of global poverty and inequality, the epicenters of these phenomena are rural. Yet global agrarian women and men are largely forgotten in terms of public policy, in terms of state budgets, but also far too largely forgotten, I think, in the wide array of scholarly research that we see. Yet it seems to me that if we are to care about processes of poverty creation, of human inequality, of social justice, we must devote more of our critical attention to agrarian societies, hence the handbook. But what do I mean by critical agrarian studies? Well, Mark Edelman and Wendy Wolford argue that critical agrarian studies takes as its key point of departure the importance of analyzing agrarian social classes and the political and economic forces that call them into existence or make them disappear, and the political and economic forces that facilitate or impede their reproduction when we analyze social change both in the countryside but also beyond the countryside. Edelman and Wolford insist on the heterogeneity of views within the field of critical agrarian studies, and hence an underlying pluralism, which for me is very important. But they identify three unifying analytical assumptions. Uh, next slide, Ingrid, please. The first assumption is that agrarian societies and urban societies mutually constitute each other, and that agrarian societies should not be constituted, should not be perceived as an other. Secondly, they insist that understanding agrarian societies requires attention to the political and cultural economy of production, accumulation, distribution, consumption, and governance, as well as the diverse relations and tensions within and between social groups. Thirdly, Edelman and Wolford argue that understanding rural society in any given place and time requires analysis of the experiences and political culture of agrarian classes and communities, of generations of men and women, and of the urban groups and institutions that interact with and affect the countryside. So critical agrarian studies, in my view, remains firmly rooted in what was classically called the agrarian question. Whether, and if so how, capitalism is transforming rural society in ways that are socially, economically, and ecologically detrimental to the lives and livelihoods of women and men, small-scale farmers and workers. As an analytical framework, the agrarian question provides a threefold set of investigative tools from which inferences can be drawn. Ingrid, next slide, please. The first tool is whether the process of production is changing, and if so, how is the process of production changing? And what I mean by this is whether the distribution of productive assets is changing, and how is it changing if it is? Is there a process of technical change taking place? And if so, what changes are taking place and who are benefiting from those changes? And in the process of production as well, is labor being commodified? And if so, what are the terms and conditions by which labor is being commodified? The second set of investigative tools lies in the realm of accumulation. And in particular, what is the pattern of accumulation that is being witnessed. Farm surpluses and deficits remain important drivers of social transformation around the rural worlds uh, of the contemporary global south. Uh, and farm surpluses and deficits can also be responsible for a lack of social transformation. And so uh, the pattern of accumulation both within and, uh, and beyond agriculture is very important for understanding processes of change. The third area, the third tools of investigation are in the realm of politics. What are the forms of political agency which are witnessed 
And what are the impacts of political agency? And this is because changes in production and changes in, uh, in accumulation have implication for rural politics because these are the very stuff of rural politics. And when I speak of rural politics, I should note that rural politics spans a diversity of forms from everyday forms of resistance, the so-called weapons of the week of James Scott, to organized insurgencies and revolutionary movements, from the covert to the overt, from the disorganized to the organized. So the agrarian question is the terrain of the four central questions of agrarian political economy identified by Henry Bernstein. Ingrid, next slide, please. The first question, who owns what? The second slide, who does what? The third slide, who gets what? And the third, the fourth uh, question, uh, what do they do with it? Who owns what? What is the distribution of assets? Who does what? What is the pattern of work? Who gets what? Where do incomes flow? What do they do with it? How are incomes used? To these, I would also add Ben White's fifth question, uh, which is uh, expressed in his very powerful short, Agriculture and the Generation Problem. Fifth, what do they do to each other? These five questions align with changes in agricultural production, with changes in accumulation, and with politics in ways that may or may not facilitate agrarian change. But critical agrarian studies goes beyond the agrarian question, in my view, in two very important ways. Firstly, it stresses the role of intersectionality in understanding rural change or the lack of rural change. Intersectionality in terms of gender, generation, ability, ethnicity, and other forms of social identity, which can be the source of social division. The agrarian question intersects with questions of gender. It intersects with questions of generation, intersects with questions of ethnicity and other social markers. For example, it's obvious production is gender. It's obvious accumulation is gender. It's obvious that rural politics are gender. These are also, of course, generational questions. And of course, the agrarian question is also an ecological question. As rural capitalism does or does not emerge, it works through nature, but nature also shapes the terms and conditions of its emergence or non-emergence. In other words, Bernstein's four questions are shaped by gender, by generation, by ecology, and other structures and processes. And this, if you like, is the basis of Ben White's fifth question. Critical agrarian studies also goes beyond the agrarian question in a second way, by placing rural change within the context of more global processes, in particular, the food regime, which is the class-mediated international relations of food production and consumption that can be directly linked to forms of accumulation. The contemporary food regime is the foundation upon which four sets of dynamic world historical processes can be identified. Firstly, the global crisis of the peasant economy, processes of de-agrarianization, and the rise of precarious and feminized labor, including waged labor in the countryside. Secondly, global land concentration, uh, engendered by land grabbing, and the rise of agro-industrial capital. Thirdly, the financialization of food and agriculture. And fourthly, the undermining of the very, of the biophysical foundations of global agriculture. These four dynamic world historical processes are unique to the 21st century. There is in the 21st century, in a very real sense, a global agrarian crisis that is hardwired into the contemporary food regime. It's from the perspective of the food regime that we can start to explore COVID-19 through the lens of critical agrarian studies. To put it bluntly, the central issue at the source of understanding the COVID-19 pandemic is the globalized, profit-driven, meat-centered world food regime that has laid the structural foundations to facilitate the expanded spread of zoonotic pathogens. Now, for people like myself, COVID-19 was not a surprise. We were expecting it which is why I was able to give my first seminar on it in February of 2020 before global lockdowns started. Ironically, that was the last seminar that I gave. 
And I should also add parenthetically that in, uh, for those of us who work in this area and think about um, the, the relationship between food systems and pathogens, uh, this is not probably going to be the worst of the pathogens that we're going to encounter out of the food system. So when you examine the table of contents of the handbook, you will find a variety of histories, concepts, methodologies, and issues that can help one better understand COVID-19. I want to uh, take a moment to divert and talk about the contemporary food regime and some of the implications of it before going into more detail about COVID-19, because in order to understand COVID-19, we really do need to get to grips with the contemporary food regime. The contemporary world food regime is clearly and uniquely capitalist. It is dominated by global agri-food transnational corporations, global agri-capital, if you like. This is driven, these are driven by the financial imperatives of short-run profitability. It is a food regime characterized by relentless food commodification and the supermarket revolution, as well as increasing oligopoly in agrochemicals, food trade, and food manufacturing. At the point of production, the dominant model of the capitalist world food regime is the fossil fuel driven, large scale, linear flow through capital intensive industrial agricultural mega farm. This Industrial agricultural mega farms have torn asunder a 10,000 year history of closed loop regenerative farming systems. Industrial agriculture uses information technologies and historically unsurpassed logistical capabilities to foster, to foster the forging of global animal protein supply chains to which as inputs transgenic organisms are used and these global animal protein supply chains are based upon the globalization of confined animal feeding operations. And this fosters the ongoing meatification of diets. The contemporary capitalist world food regime is predicated on and requiring the massive use of hydrocarbons. It supplies mass produced, standardized, highly durable processed food based upon soy and high fructose corn syrup for the global middle classes. This so-called Fortis food has lower profit margins and relies upon shifting food, therefore, in much larger volumes. At the same time, the capitalist world food regime supplies so-called healthy, so-called nutritional, so-called fresh, so-called organic, so-called green foods for the global upper classes. The standardized differentiation of this so-called post-Fortis food has far higher profit margins. The capitalist world food regime is sustained by states, international institutions, and big philanthropy. It bypasses the needs of the food insecure, while at the same time generating low paying jobs for billions of people. Now let me stress three key points about the capitalist world food regime. Ingrid, next slide, please. This slide shows uh, the global commodity chain of the capitalist world food system uh, in 2007. Uh, it's never been update, updated by Joachim von Braun, who is the person responsible for it. And I really wish someone would update it, but that requires research resources, which I don't have. What this uh, commodity chain, this, this crude, but very effective commodity chain demonstrates is that the world food regime in what is one in which specific transnational corporations are able to exert very strong power over the food systems, over the food system. In 2007, supermarkets captured, the four biggest supermarkets captured one quarter of all the value produced in the world food regime. Since 2007, the value of the world food regime has increased to $8 trillion, but the distribution of the value has not changed. And the four biggest supermarkets continue to capture one quarter of all the value in the food system. So the choice that we witness in the food regime is one that is embedded within strongly oligopolistic companies that are able to use their market power to roll prices back to the supposed benefit of the eater, but in reality, to the benefit of corporate profitability. The second point I want to make is that the capitalist world food regime is fostering meatification and obesity creating what Gerardo Otero calls the neoliberal diet. 
Ingrid, next slide, please. Poultry production in particular has driven the meatification of diets as companies like Tyson industrialized chicken production. But similar processes are also work at work in beef and pork. And beef in particular is a hugely inefficient way of securing access to protein. Ingrid, next slide, please. Global meat consumption averages 40 kilos per person per year, but this masks huge global differences. As in the US, average meat consumption is 120 kilos per person per year, while in India, it is less than 10 kilos per person per year. Along with meat, the, incre the huge increase in processed food sold in supermarkets means that eaters are consuming historically unparalleled volumes of so-called bad sugars, and particularly high fructose corn syrup, along of course with bulk fillers like palm oil and soya. Uh, Ingrid, next slide, please. The massive increase in energy intake from bad sugars helps explain the malnutrition crisis that we development practitioners do not really talk about, and that is the malnutrition crisis of obesity. The third point I want to make about the contemporary world food regime is that, as the International Panel on Climate Change has noted, the contemporary food system is based upon a model of production, distribution, and consumption that, in its hydrocarbon dependence and greenhouse gas emissions, significantly worsens the climate crisis and degrades the ecological foundations of the very farm production upon which it depends. In 2007 and 2008, the IPCC estimated that around one quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions could be linked to agriculture. Ingrid, next slide, please. But in 2021, just 13 years later, the FAO says that that quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions has now risen to 31% of all greenhouse gas emissions. As Tony Weiss so eloquently puts it, the capitalist food regime has a massive ecological hoofprint, which is expanding over time. The capitalist world food regime produces ever cheaper food that lowers the cost of reproducing labor, and in so doing increases the rate of exploitation, and this increases the rate of surplus value. The capitalist world food regime requires massive quantities of unpaid care and domestic work, three quarters of which is performed by women, who should have a market value in the trillions of dollars if it was monetarily valued. The capitalist world food regime also requires both capitalism's capacity to work through nature and nature's capacity to work through capitalism as new agricultural frontiers in terms of space, in terms of nature, in terms of labor and in terms of commodification are enclosed. And as the unpaid work of nature provides the energy upon which the capitalist world food regime operates. The contemporary capitalist food regime is therefore predicated upon the production of global human inequality. The food regime is not concerned with the production of food. It's a subtle, but I think very important point. It's not concerned with the production of food. It is concerned with the production of commodities whose value can be realized through market sales that generate profits for the dominant actors in the production of those commodities. And that is transnational capital. Ingrid, next slide, please. As the left-hand panel in this figure illustrates, the profitability in the secondary processing and retail sections of the global agri-food value chain is really quite impressive. Indeed, the missing link between the record hunger, record production, and record prices witnessed in the capitalist food regime is record profits, the record profits that drive the regime. Now let me take the, the remaining time that I've got, I've got to make the link between the capitalist for world food regime and COVID-19 more explicit. SARS-CoV-2 is a zoonotic disease. Zoonotic diseases are human bacterial and viral infections that originate in non-human animals and which cross the species barrier. Something on the order of 60% of emerging new diseases that cross from non-human animals to humans uh, are zoonotic diseases, and this has been accelerating over the course 
of the 21st century. Now, zoonotic transmission from non-human animals to the human is as old as settled agriculture. The question that therefore needs to be asked is why has the share of human pathogens originating in zoonoses seemingly increased? Ingrid, next slide, please. The answer lies in the structural characteristics of the capitalist world food regime. The capitalist food regime is structuring global farming in a way that acts as both propulsion for and nexus through which pathogens of diverse origins migrate from the most remote reservoirs to the most international of population centers, and in so doing, as we've experienced, bring death to millions. As I've noted, the capitalist world food regime has witnessed the growing dominance of large-scale, linear flow-through, capital-intensive industrial agricultural megafarms. Industrial agriculture's monocropping and lack of biodiversity that results from excessive specialization is highly vulnerable to ecological shocks, while at the same time removing immune firebreaks that can slow back vectors of pathogen transmission. Moreover, the reduced nutritional content found in modified cultivar genomes renders populations more vulnerable to nutrient shocks and weakens the capacity of the body to respond to unknown pathogens, a weakness that malnutrition, whether hunger or obesity, reinforces. The myth behind these farms is that they're needed to feed growing populations. But in fact, many of these farms are growing crops destined to feed animals being raised for meat. Industrial livestock production that flows from meatification in the capitalist world food regime breeds its own diseases like swine flu and avian flu in concentrated animal feeding operations and on factory farms. These farming methods significantly enhance the virulence of those viruses that emerge from factory farm pigs and poultry, among others, before they cross from animal to human. Virulence is increased because modern animal farming significantly weakens the resistance of animals to pathogens even as the massive applications of antibiotics to combat pathogens contributes to antibiotic resistance, cumulatively exacerbating the problem of new pathogens. So industrial agriculture ratchets up the increased rate by which zoonotic pathogens cross from animals to humans. This is something that has become highly regular in the, form of severe, in the form of severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, in 2003, in the form of H1N1, or swine flu, in 2009, and in the COVID-19 pandemic that started at the end of 2019. It's become so regular that it is predictable. As the radical epidemiologist in the United States, Rob Wallace, so cogently puts it, Big farms make big flu. At the same time, as industrial agriculture has spread in the 21st century, small scale petty commodity producers, many of whom are women, have become further marginalized. The capitalist world food regime produces through enclosures of land and other resources as mega farms expand, as well as the market imperative of cost competitiveness an agrarian crisis for many small-scale petty commodity producing peasant farmers around the global south. Peasant farmers face a simple reproduction squeeze because the world market prices they face fail to cover the costs of production that they have at the farm gate, resulting in debt, immiserization, and for many, an exit from farming. For those that do not exit, small-scale farmers have responded to this marginalization in one of two ways. Firstly, some small-scale farmers have had to move because of their marginalization. They move to less cultivable, often forested areas where they encroach on wilder habitats, putting in place a possible channel through which animal viruses can be transmitted to humans as forest to disease dynamics enter peri-urban settings. Secondly, some small-scale farmers have diversified production into lucrative, higher-value products that, when commodified, can be easily sold in nearby markets. For livestock farmers marginalized by industrial livestock production, 
One group of these higher value products are animals that were once caught and eaten for subsistence and which have not traditionally been bred in captivity to be sold as commodified food. Snakes, beavers, turtles, porcupines, baby crocodiles, mallard ducks, pangolins, among others. For these small scale livestock farmers, economic marginalization has forced them to produce such commodities for niche markets in which they can realize more value. Such commodities can then be supplemented by higher value domesticated animals that are not traditionally eaten as food, but for which a food market exists. Animals such as dogs and cats to name two. Indeed, this niche market specialization is the very logic of the market imperative of the capitalist world food regime. Yet the commodification of farm raised so-called wild animals raised in captivity can also create the opportunity for pathogens to cross from non-traditional farmed animals to livestock and from there into humans. Indeed, when farmers raising non-traditional farmed animals are successful in exploiting the opportunities afforded by markets, this creates incentives to increase the scale of their activity, which amplifies the possibility of zoonotic transmission. This has been a well-established route by which small-scale farmers unable to compete with Chinese industrial livestock production have crafted their livelihood strategies in, for example, the Pearl River Delta. So the food regime, in the food regime, industrial agriculture and the survival strategies of small scale petty commodity producing farmers has laid the groundwork from which new virulent pathogens can emerge and can continue to emerge. While producing and distributing food in ways that can weaken the resistance of highly unequal populations to new pathogens. The food insecurities and malnutrition created by the food regime renders large swathes of the global population more susceptible to new diseases. While inequalities in work and care place stresses on gendered and racialized populations, and most notably, those that rely on rural labor markets as the principal source of their income. The climate crisis then only serves to reinforce these structural tendencies. There's one final way in which critical agrarian studies, in my view, can serve to illuminate the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates a central pathology of contemporary capitalism, its reliance on what Frederick Engels called social murder. Engels' understanding of social murder rested on three conditions that he witnessed in Manchester in the early 1840s. The first was that those that died were those at the bottom of a highly unequal society. And of course, we see this today. The second condition was that those who died did so because of the terms and conditions by which capitalism operated. Again, we see this today. The third observation of Engels was that those who died have died because of the lax indifference of those in positions of economic, political, and social power. This to me is perhaps the most shocking aspect of what we see today. The lax indifference of the Johnsons, of the Trumps, of the Bolsonaros, of the Modis. Social murder has always been integral to the operation of contemporary capitalism, but nowhere has this been more starkly revealed than in the morbidities arising out of the capitalist world food regime, which are embodied in COVID-19. I've added one last point just today about COVID-19, because people do ask me this, how does it end? There are four possible ways. It can become extinct. It can become eradicated. It can become regionally or locally eliminated. Or it can become endemic, a constant presence. The first two, extinction or eradication, look impossible. The third, regional or local elimination, as we see, for example, in China, can involve draconian restrictions. That leaves it becoming endemic. 
Now, becoming endemic does not mean that it becomes benign. Think of the, the, the hundreds of thousands that die of malaria, an endemic disease. Think of the hundreds of thousands that die of HIV AIDS, an endemic disease. Also, when it becomes endemic, this does not mean that it does not evolve and possibly mutate into a more virulent strain. And finally, if it becomes endemic, this means we cannot cast aside suppression measures. Think of malaria again. We have to maintain wearing masks, which the British government is going to end next week. Social murder, in my view. If COVID-19 becomes endemic, Malaria and HIV demonstrates that it does not imply it being mild. Clearly then, the terms and conditions by which the capitalist world food regime operates serves to simultaneously multiply and deepen threats to global health. There is in fact a comorbidity between COVID-19 and the capitalist world food regime. A, COVID mor a, a comorbidity that critical agrarian studies can serve to interrogate and illuminate, while at the same time raising important questions about the path of global development and whether that path is one that brings benefits to the many or to the few and why. Ingrid, the last slide, please. If this talk has interested you, you can find out more on my podcast, The World Food System. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for this first and hopefully not last opportunity to present in the interrogating development seminar at King's College. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harun. That was really interesting and thought provoking and we still have lots of time for discussion. So I'll now pass it on to Jalata Sarkar, lecturer here at King's at the India Institute uh, to give her reaction. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Ingrid. Um, and thank you to Haroon for this fascinating talk. Um, thank you to uh, the Department of International Development for giving me this opportunity to offer comments on Haroon's very interesting and very urgent research um, on COVID-19 and the world food system, as well as on the recently published handbook of uh, critical agrarian studies. So my comments are going to be in three parts thematically. Uh, but they're of course interconnected and Harun, please feel free to respond in any format you prefer. Um, so first I'm going to comment on uh, the volume itself, the, the co-edited handbook, which I think is a very important contribution and deserves a session of its own. Uh, but I'll try to keep that brief and then move on to the second part, which relates um, more directly to your talk today. And I hope to offer some observations and questions on the scope of critical agrarian studies as a field um, in light of your talk and what we need to do as a community of researchers to shape the future of this field. Um, and finally, in the third part, I'm going to raise a few methodological questions, which I think emerge out of the themes that we've been discussing, but also specifically out of um, the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me start by describing where I come from in my reading of this handbook and my engagement with Harun's talk today, as also with the Critical Agrarian Studies Scholarship overall. So I have been, for all intents and purposes, a disciplinarily unanchored researcher with no set loyalties, uh, except to the larger project of Critical Social Science Scholarship and to situated embedded and minimally extractive ways of doing research. So I started out in development studies looking at rural livelihoods in India with a focus on the caste and gender dimensions of labor relations. And this quickly led to the realization that the rural or the agrarian cannot be studied in isolation from the urban and the metropolitan, um, as Harun noted in his talk today and the handbook also notes. So this then led to a stint for me in urban studies where I looked at a range of urban settlements from the smallest category of rural market towns to emerging smart cities. Um, and this further consolidated for me the learning that not only are the rural and the urban intensely interconnected, but also that a lot of the thematic areas that we tend to treat as discrete, um, such as ecology, digitization, unsettling the gender binary, et cetera, um, are also intrinsically connected to the urban question and the agrarian question. 
And that is why I currently see myself as simply a critical geographer because geography is that open-ended and ever-evolving discipline that can be home to all these sort of seemingly disparate questions uh, while still providing sort of unifying framework. So from that perspective of being a geographer, I'm very tempted to claim critical agrarian studies as a geographical field of inquiry. And this handbook, I think, will be a very, very useful tool, both to students and teachers of geography across all levels. And it is, in fact, the first time that I have encountered a handbook that brings together so many of the themes and questions that researchers like me are interested in and has provided a clear insight into how these themes and questions are interconnected. I was especially happy to see the two sections of the handbook titled Debates and Trajectories uh, and the chapters that are tracing the relationship between post-colonial studies and critical agrarian studies, between political ecology and critical agrarian studies, and between science and technology studies and critical agrarian studies. So thank you to Harun and his co-editors for putting together this really wonderful resource that I, I look forward to reading more chapters from. That brings me to Harun's talk today. Um, you have a chapter on COVID-19 in the handbook as well. And what I found particularly striking in the talk as well as in the chapter is the manner in which it makes explicit the connection between the local and the global, uh, the entanglements between the global north and south and everything that lies in between. Geographers, of course, of the critical post-colonial persuasion have been studying and critiquing these unequal relations for many decades, but from a critical agrarian studies lens, the drawing of attention to these relations becomes not so much um, an exercise in just exposing the power structures at play, but rather presenting them as a necessary starting point for any analysis of anything anywhere in the world. So for instance, when looking at industrial agriculture and the making of big flu, as you mentioned in the global north, a critical agrarian study perspective would take into account how the market imperatives of industrial agriculture produce the conditions for niche markets for exoticized food to exist in parts of the global south. And this means that researchers can no longer afford to approach their research themes and topics through the geographical silos of North and South. And it also means that researchers need to expand the thematic scope of their analysis. Um, and I think COVID-19 and critical agrarian studies present us with the mandate to do so. Uh, so researchers who were concerned about farm size or farm income or agricultural markets must now also necessarily be concerned about zoonotic infections and transmissions. Uh, they must also be concerned about the structures of management of human animal relations. Uh, they must also be concerned about public health policy crises such as the vaccine apartheid. So my question then is how do we as a community of researchers and educators prepare ourselves to tackle this very vastly expanded agenda? And what kinds of university programs, research groups, or course curriculum do we develop in response to COVID-19 from a crit critical agrarian studies perspective? And what would the everyday work of entrenching this agenda and working towards fulfilling it look like? Because as you mentioned, uh, the, the kind of purpose behind your handbook, but also behind critical agrarian studies overall, is to introduce a new generation of scholars uh, to this approach and, and, and the scope of, of doing this work. And I ask this also while being completely mindful of the kind of policy climate that we seem to be heading into at a transnational scale. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, Arundhati Roy had published an essay called The Pandemic is a Portal, which to me read like an optimistic analysis of how systemic and structural change in the positive direction would become an inevitability on the other side of the pandemic. But now two years into experiencing the pandemic, I think we are looking at an extension of an intensification of business as usual, where you know, the pandemic becomes an excuse to impose even greater curtailments on the rights of the most marginalized populations. So how, how do we respond to this from a critical agrarian studies standpoint? And finally, I come to the third part of my comments, which has to do with questions of methodology. Uh, one of the things that critical agrarian studies has successfully done is to demonstrate the importance of ethnography and qualitative analysis for arriving at a nuanced and adequate study of social reality. And COVID-19 had at least temporarily made ethnography impossible. And even as travel restrictions lift, it becomes more evident than ever before that mobility and access are highly differentiated across lines of social position and power. 
does this then present us with an opportunity to pivot towards a different methodological form where those who we thought of as informants or participants or interlocutors can now assume positions of greater narrative agency and maybe become co-authors and co-creators of knowledge. Um, and so instead of us researchers going elsewhere to study other people, uh, is it possible to put in place a system where people themselves are able to put forth their voices and perspectives and our role becomes that of facilitating and synth synthesizing this uh, sort of firsthand narrative with archival sources and secondary data. And I was very intrigued by you know, the, the scale of data that you had on display today. Um, and, and I wonder what are the mechanisms of going about putting together those kinds of you know, large scale data sets in a, in a post pandemic world. Um, so I, I'll stop at that for now. And thank you once again for the fascinating talk and for the handbook of critical agrarian studies. And I look forward to hearing your response. Thank you so much for those great comments. So, well, Haruna, if you want to respond, you can do that before we open up to, to questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Shalata, for uh, those uh, extraordinarily kind comments uh, on the handbook itself. I, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, what you've said about it. Um, I do agree with you really fundamentally that this division between the rural and the urban has to really, it's a silo for which I myself am personally guilty. But, you know, we really do have to break it down. And of course, the person that, you know, that always told us this was the great Jan Bremen, you know, uh, and, and that's why there's a chapter on footloose labor. You know, footloose labor as a as a as a as a concept is something which, in my view, is far too inadequately used outside South Asia, uh, in terms of trying to understand. You know, the you know what in China they call the floating army, which go which goes in and comes back and goes in and comes back. And we have to, we really do have to understand this much much better. And I do also uh, think that the book, uh, that the handbook, brings out very well these what you call the global local entanglements, and that we have to situate what's going on locally with those wider, sometimes, sometimes local, sometimes regional, sometimes national, very often international power structures which structure the operation of the system. So we have to break down uh, these, these silos. And you know, it, I will say that in terms of breaking down these silos, uh, I will not accept the, the claiming of critical agrarian studies for, for geography, uh, because we precisely need to break down those silos. I mean, you know, I'm from a generation in which, uh, you know, we, I, I, you know, I was trained that there's only one discipline, and that's political economy. And everything else is an attempt to sidestep us away from the key issues we need uh, to think about. Um, let, me, let me take a couple of minutes about your questions. Really demanding questions. The easy answer is in terms of curricula and courses. And I think there are, I think there's two things that really uh, have to be stressed here. And that is that um, we have to rethink our courses and our curricula so that uh, the impacts of COVID-19, which will be long lasting uh, around the world, uh, a seismic event in the way that World War II was a seismic event, uh, the way that World War I was a seismic event, means we need to restructure courses so that uh, the, the pandemic and the possibilities of future pandemics, along with climate change, become mainstreamed across everything that we're doing. It's absolutely essential. And disciplinary boundaries uh, aside, we really do need to do this. And I have tried to do this in my, in my teaching since uh, the pandemic started. Um, more difficult, how do we prepare ourselves to tackle this greater agenda? Um, you know, honestly, I really think that we really need to focus much more on understanding people's lived lives, but, but within the power structures in which they operate. And so in some way, I think to prepare ourselves for the, for the agenda, we have to dig down to communities and work far more closely with communities. We need to think far more about the lived experiences of those who have been marginalized through processes of capitalist development. Situating those lived lives uh, 
situating them within the power structures in which people, to which people are subjected and to which they do express agency, but that agency is constrained. You know, so we have to pay, pay far greater uh, attention to both structure and agency as Norman Long, the great Norman Long would have, would have put it. It's really quite fundamental. Um, and, you know, many of those who work in critical social sciences work on the, on, on the scale of structure or they work on the scale of agency, but they don't try and link these things together. I think that's very important, particularly in light of the second question that you raised, how do we respond to the intensification of the marginalization of populations, which we've seen as a result of the pandemic and the resulting vaccine apartheid? You know, I remember very clearly that when the 2008 financial crisis broke out, and it seemed for a few days that there was the slightest possibility that finance capital might collapse, that this might be a moment of transformation. Many people thought this. No. At the time, I said this will lead to a, 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 an intensification of neoliberal policy responses, which is exactly what happened. Because, you know, for global capital, the crisis is an opportunity to foster even more intense commodification, to foster even more intense processes of exploitation, yeah? So we need to realize the way that in the communities in which we, we, we want to do our research and the people that we want to talk to, that the marginalization that they face is, is dynamic and deepening as a consequence of this. And we need to respond to that recognizing so that people because of the pandemic, because of climate change, because of you know, pro uh, processes of globalized capitalist development, deepening marginalization is endemic to people's lives. And that has to be a starting point from what we do. The third question you face, you, you, you pose to me about how do we do our ethnography? And is this a point in which we can pivot so that those who have become the subjects can become the co-authors? Well, on the one hand, I would like to think that in good critical agrarian studies research, this is already the case, that good, you know, that, that, that good scholars, that their subjects are not subjects at all. You know, they are the people that do research about themselves because action-oriented research is fundamentally about, you know, people getting a greater understanding of their circumstances, their, 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 their knowledge of their circumstances expanding in ways that, that they may not have thought before. But of course, as you rightly imply far too often, it's, you know, it's you know, research participants and it's the author comes from the North. I mean, it's gonna be, it, it, it's going to be more difficult to get permission to do a lot of research. Having said that, most people I know are still trying to arrange their research visits. I count myself among those, uh, realizing that research will have to be done quite differently in an age of endemic COVID-19, particularly in developing countries. Um, but I would like, I, I do think that in good critical agrarian studies work, ethnographic work is situated very close to uh, the communities in which uh, one is working, and that the starting point is the validation of the knowledge of those that are being, I don't want to use the word research, but the, those, that, those that are the, 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 uh, the, I don't want to use the objects of research, but I'll just say it because of time. Those that are the objects of research are participants in it, and their voices are heard. Um, I think good research already does this, and for those that do the good research, the pivot will be less, for those that don't follow this, they need to learn from those sorts of best practices, I think. I think those are quite inadequate questions, uh, quite inadequate answers to what were very demanding questions, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And thank you again for um, the very gracious comments on, on my hand. Thank you so much, Arun, and again, Philata. So we have two questions already in the chat. So I would suggest that those of you um, here who want to ask a question, uh, verbally, just raise your hand and then you'll be in line to ask a question. Uh, but I'll take the, because there are already two questions that have come up in the chat, so I'll just post those, and they're very big questions, so I'll, I'll post both of them. 
now and then we'll come to those of you that have your hands up. Um, so the first one was by, um, and you can also see it in the chat, it was posted to everyone, uh, Sierra Versillo. And she says, a very important and interesting talk. I appreciate all of the important connections. I'm wondering if you could speak further to the role of development actors, specifically foreign assistance, which you implied when you mentioned philanthropy. Thank you. So that's the first question, development actors. And then the second one by, from Matt Berkeley says, thank you, Haroon. Could you please say more about what a sensible global food system would look like and some first steps towards it? So two big questions there. Okay, uh, Sierra, I think um, development actors is a very broad phrase, but the, the, the mention of philanthropy is, is, is a, a foreign philanthropy is really important. I mean, um, many of the attempts to transform small scale petty commodity production in developing countries since the 1950s, of course, have been driven by foreign philanthropy. The Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation so heavily implicated in the Green Revolution, the Gates Foundation so heavily implicated in attempts to introduce transgenic organisms, uh, particularly into Sub-Saharan Africa as a, as, as a way of supposedly trying to deal uh, with the need for uh, increased food supplies. One has to treat foreign ph philanthropic actors very, very carefully. Um, many philanthropic actors are building what some scholars refer to as philanthrocapitalism. Uh, they're using uh, their philanthropy to refine the terms and conditions by which capital reshapes developing country livelihoods, urban and rural. Uh, not all philanthropists work in this way, I should say. I mean, um, I used to, I, I was up until the end of the year on the board of the Women's Rights Program of the Open Societies Foundation. And prior to the, prior to the assumption of the new president, who I won't, don't want to talk about because I'll put me down another road, uh, the Women's rights programs were, were women's rights program was responsible for facilitating informal unionization in several countries around the world by underpaid women. And that kind of philanthropy is really quite remarkable and flies under the radar. There are several philanthropic organizations that do do this. So one has to be very careful about painting the philanthropic uh, organizations with a uniform brush. You have to dig in to what it is they're actually doing. And in some ways one could say that again about the development actors. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a range of what the broader development actor community is about. Obviously what we've seen as a consequence of the pandemic is from the IMF, for example, very interesting rhetoric about the need uh, uh, to end vaccine apartheid and get everyone vaccinated with the chief economist giving uh, estimates of the financial benefits of rapidly promoting global vaccination. But on the other hand, of course, IMF programs being exactly the same as they have been since the 1950s, you know, leading to further intensification. Pakistan is, on, is in the process right now of negotiating a new facility, even as uh, uh, elections in Khyber Pukhtunkhwa have, have led to uh, the assumption of uh, Islamist uh, provincial government, uh, Islamist mayor in, in Peshawar. Um, you know, the IMF uh, talks one way and walks the other. Uh, the rhetoric of the bank has very much been about making markets work better to deal with COVID-19, more of the same. Um, in terms of the uh, regional development banks, uh, although there's the recognition of the need to combat uh, the, need, the need to combat the pandemic by increasing vaccination. In terms of actual uh, interventions, uh, much remains the same. And so what we see is that the development actors uh, reinforcing the intensification of the marginalization produced by the transformations wrought by global capitalism in many places. 
So, you know, it's, it's very much, much of the same in my view, uh, in terms of the actions of development actors. Uh, I, I think the one that I would, uh, I would um, put aside from this is not a development actor, but of course the WHO for all of its faults and flaws as an under-resourced organization is one that does speak uh, to very powerful development actors and speaks in ways that um, challenges what they are doing, I think. UNCTAD does exactly the same thing. So there are elements within the development actor uh, universe where, again, one should be very careful about painting people with the, the same brush. I mean, UNCTAD does really good work on you know, the need to end vaccine apartheid. So one has to be careful about this. Matt's question, you know, what would a remade global food system look like? Well, I got to tell you, that's a separate lecture, uh, which I'm giving in a few weeks. But to put, to put it down to nuts and bolts, um, the issue isn't so much what, a, what, what, what uh, an alternative food system might look like. The most important issue is how do we get there? How do we get to it? And the important thing to really stress here is that around the world, there are social movements that are acting to transform food systems uh, in, the in, in their in their day-to-day -day actions and lives. And these very often are organizations which are affiliated with La Via Campesina, you know, largest social movement in the world, but not exclusively so. There are many actors working in what uh, Jennifer Clapp calls the interstices of the food system trying to create more what, what Ray Bush calls feasible utopias, you know, on the ground action, which tries to transform things in the here and now by opening up spaces of difference. Um, and those spaces of difference are designed to show what alternatives can do and their potential. An alternative food system uh, that, is, that is driven by these actors, although not all of these actors are anti-capitalist, a significant proportion of them are because they recognize that the linkages between the capitalist world food regime and global capitalism are so tight that the only way that you're going to get an alternative food system is by the transformation of capitalism itself. But their point is the place in which you start to transform capitalism is through the food system because it relies on low paid labor, which is exploited. Yeah. And that runs on cheap food. You know, the reason why one in every $2 on food in the United States is spent at a Walmart is because it is cheap, which means that the massive numbers of people who are underpaid in the United States can only shop at Walmart. The food system is designed to deliver cheap food to them, which affects their health. So, you know, you really do have to transform the way in which the food system operates, but that requires a transformation of the broader system. Food is a way of thinking about that transformation because the actors that are involved in trying to build an alternative have been trying to do so for more than 20 years. And uh, there's lots and lots of good research that has been done on this. Some of it has been done by me. There's lots and lots of activism that's been done of it, done on it, a very small amount done by me. You know, but the activism is really, really uh, important. Um, you know, broadly speaking, you know, an alternative food system has got to be one which cools the planet, which improves people's health, is, has to be one in which, uh, you know, offers the opportunity of improving livelihoods uh, for those who are producing food itself, um, and has to be one which rebuilds community. And that kind of a food system uh, in many parts of the world is tied into agroecology. In some parts of the world, it's tied into other forms of more regenerative farming practices. I think the really important thing to remember here is that our food system is so new. And when you've been raised in it, you think it's been around forever, but it's not the case. As I, as I said at one point in my last book, when I was, when I was young, and we would have a Sunday meal, most of the food came from within a hundred miles. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't have a globalized food system. 
you know, this is something which is very recent. And that's, you know, the deglobalization of food, the decommodification of food is absolutely central to building an alternative. But I'll leave it at that because that really is too big a question for this particular seminar. Thanks for it, Gomer. Thanks a lot. So now I know there's uh, one in the chat that came, came after Michael put up a hand, so I'm going to pass it on to Michael first. First of all, thank you for a great lecture and a really voluminous handbook. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, awesome. Um, so my question is, what can critical agrarian studies say to the relationship between access to PPE and vaccines, um, as well as to like the national and the agrarian question? Said differently, uh, how does national sovereign projects in the South relate, uh, and what does critical agrarian studies have to say about uh, that in pertaining to access to vaccines? Okay, Michael. Um, let me start with the second part of, of the question first, by way of trying to answer that. You know, I was trained in a, a model of political economy in which countries were seeking to develop. And at the time that I was trained, this was not located within the wider impact of colonialism and imperialism. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I've had to do over the past 25 years is really rethink that in quite fundamental ways. That, you know, as you get older, you realize that history, you live through it, and it's, it's incredibly recent. And therefore, history does inform the present in very powerful ways. If you look at the work of Utsa Patnaik on the financial drains out of British India, you know, over the course of the colonial period, the scale of those drains has fundamentally shaped post-colonial India and the terms and conditions by which it has been located within a global economy. And what this means is we have to really realize um, that agrarian questions within states have been shaped by colonialism uh, to a much greater degree than we did before. And that the ability to resolve them really does start by recognizing the extent to which the marginalization of many countries in the South continues as resources continue to be extracted uh, from them. You know, the, the Zambias of the world, you know, who, uh, you know, you know, who, who gave up, you know, access to royalties to, to, their, to their copper resources for pennies, just for pennies, you know, resulting in re-agrarianization. We have to link these, these two things together and recognize that uh, so much of we think of as global capitalism has built, been built by, by colonial drains, you know. And I, I've, I, wrote a sh I, I wrote a short piece on this on a, a book that came out uh, meant for um, uh, public education purposes called the Fair Trade Handbook, in which I provide some of the, the more recent estimates of the scale of these drains. And, you know, we really have to remember that, you know, the colonial period rooted as it was on genocide and enslavement was designed to transfer resources. You know, and I have to say that one of the, one of the great things, one of the great resources we've had more recently is you've got you know, a, a left Keynesian like Thomas Piketty also demonstrating the extent to which there were significant resource drains from colonial countries. Now, in terms of getting into access to vaccines, this affects access to vaccines in a couple of ways. Obviously developing countries are under-resourced you know, health systems don't work very well. Um, you know, I'm one of the few people that I know who've had to, in several instances, had to use developing country health systems. And, you know, I was, you know, it worked fine for me, but they don't work well, you know, and you go and see a doctor and the doctor says, don't go to the hospital, for example. Um, so health systems are under-resourced. Health, system, 
our health systems are under-resourced because of decades of austerity, which has collapsed the state and collapsed the power of the state um, to be able to um, provide public goods for populations. Uh, while at the same time, um, the creation of predatory states has been encouraged by global elites. Uh, so this has all shaped contemporary access to vaccines. Obviously, um, there's a need to override patents. Yeah, um, there's a need to override patents. It should have been done in 2020. Oh, well, obviously, it shouldn't have been a case in the first place. Um, it should have happened right away. Um, but the fact that, you know, the Pfizer's and the Moderna's, you know, you had these huge transfers of developed country resources into these private sector companies, big pharma, which, which you know, has led to huge increases in their profitability. This has shaped access to vaccines. And so, you know, uh, the national question, the agrarian question, access to vaccines, austerity, you know, as Shrilata really pointed out in her comments, we've got to really realize, you know, the interconnectedness of the agrarian to the non-agrarian in order to, to really uh, answer this. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, so we have two more um, uh, questions in the chat. Um, one is by Tom Lines, who you've touched a little bit on it uh, already. Uh, but it's a very direct question asking, how would you say the food sovereignty movement stands in relation to critical agrarian studies? Um, should I take one more? <laughs> no, no can... Ingrid, I think there's enough yeah. time. I can answer that. I can answer that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom, I'd put it this way, and that is that critical agrarian studies is born out of the food sovereignty movement. It's born out of the academic activists, those who, who straddle the two worlds, of which there are many. Um, and what they wanted to do was create a pluralist universe in which a range of views could come together in support of movements for food sovereignty. Um, I don't know many who work in um, the field of critical agrarian studies who are not supportive of the global movement for food sovereignty. Um, there are a couple that might be far more critical of it, and but they might not call themselves as working in critical agrarian studies. So these things are born, I would say, together. The one thing I would caution is we have to be exceedingly careful in the use of food sovereignty, just as we have to be very careful in the use of agroecology, because you know what we've seen over the past 10 years is once again, as can be expected, attempts to, uh, by institutional uh, by institutions to co-opt this so um just as um you know the fao says that it is systematically promoting agroecology and we know that there are some elements within the fao that are but most of it is not uh you know in the canadian province of quebec there is a food sovereignty law but what they mean by food sovereignty is not what I think you and I would mean by food sovereignty. You know, so we have to be very careful in the usage of food sovereignty as a phrase. There are many people uh, who uh, become interested in food, uh, the politics and economics of food, particularly in the developed world. They start using the word food sovereignty without actually investigating the concrete meaning of it. And when they don't investigate the concrete meaning of it, they're very loose in how they use it. This is particularly a problem, I think, in the United States and in Canada. Uh, if, you were, if you dig deeply into trying to understand food sovereignty, your next step has to be to join the National Farmers Union in Canada. And yet most people don't. So, uh, but to answer the question very directly, they are, they are, they are, they are they, you know, critical agrarian studies grows out of the scholar activists of the food sovereignty movement. Cool, thank you. Uh, so next question is from Bupendra Kumar, who says, thank you, Haroon, for this wonderful talk in the present UN-centric depoliticized development paradigm. I was wondering what possibility do you see for repoliticizing of the development agenda from a critical agrarian studies point of view? Well, I think, Bupendra, the way I would put it 
is this, and that is going back to Tom's point, from the standpoint of food sovereignty movements in the South, the development agenda has always been politicized. I think it never was not politicized. I think that when you take the part of advocates and actors on the ground, you know, in communities, recognizing their heterogeneity, recognizing the contradictions that exist within those actors and thinking about how those contradictions might be um, uh, managed. Uh, when you take the part of those actors, development was never depoliticized. Where it's been depoliticized is in the developed countries of the North, in the development agencies, where development becomes a technical problem to be solved, usually by finding a magic bullet. Uh, you know, for the past 25 years, that magic bullet has been neoliberal capitalism. Um, you know, there has been, ironically, a challenge to that neoliberal capitalism uh, in the past five years or so. It hasn't come from the left. It's come from the authoritarian populist right who want to create a much more crony form of capitalism, something which is much more neoconservative in many ways in its orientation than neoliberal. Uh, but the depoliticization is very much something which has happened, you know, in the office blocks of, of Rome and in Nairobi and in uh, uh, Brussels and in places like that. Having said that, having said that, you know, one of the, one of the great benefits of, of the work, the job that I have, is that I've had the privilege of working with many people, in many parts of the world, you know, many of whom work for these agencies because of the best job they can get. And so many of these people are committed to fundamentally transforming their societies in more equitable and just ways. And this is the avenue that they have to go to. And they do become bureaucratized and they know it. But within that bureaucracy, they do try and make a difference. So, you know, these institutions which have sought to depoliticize uh, development have had actors working within them, seeking to repoliticize it as they go along. And in some instances, I think, again, I'd use the case of UNCTAD, moderate success, you know. Uh, in, in other agencies, it's cut, the, the differences between country offices in UN agencies can be so immense. And you can find incredibly progressive ones right next door to incredibly regressive ones. So uh, the point fundamentally is that, you know, for people on the ground, it was never depoliticized. Thank you. Um, so there are no questions in the, on the floor at the moment. Uh, so I'm wondering if you would like to come back to a lot and add anything or, or any other reactions that you might have to, to Harun's talk or any of the questions. Um, who are you I, asking? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ingrid. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a few questions in mind and I think the discussion has sort of provoked them further. And so what I want to do is kind of point out like tensions and contradictions that exist within this idea of transforming, you know, the global food system and just hear from you about, you know, your, your thoughts on that or, you know, thinking aloud on that, if you will. So one of the things I was thinking about is that um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has, you know, kind of in the context of India, it has, you know, propelled public discourse in a certain direction. So meat consumption, I mean, you, you showed on the on the graph that South Asia has, you know, amongst the lowest meat consumption per capita uh, per year, and meat consumption is highly stigmatized, uh, essentially because of the caste system. And, you know, it's, it's stigmatized along caste lines, and it is mostly uh, people from what are considered to be lower castes um, that are usually consuming uh, uh, larger portions of meat in, in their diets. Um, and this meat is, of course, not, you know, produced in this global big farm capital intensive fashion yet. But um, there is, you know, some kind of tendency to move towards that. Um, but because meat consumption was already stigmatized uh, and because there was this direct connection between uh, 
consumption of animal products and you know COVID-19, it got further stigmatized and something that was already you know at the receiving end of like almost genocidal attacks, you know, physical violence against those suspected of uh, cow slaughter or beef smuggling, uh, you know, went to, it received a kind of, you know, moral sanction, you know, under, under the COVID-19 discourse, uh, which also, you know, aligns very closely with the racialization and, you know, the racialized attacks on uh, people perceived to be Chinese. Um, so, you know, how would you, how would you kind of reconcile those kinds of developments under COVID-19 with also a push for, you know, vegan diets. And I saw this statistic recently that in the UK now, 33% of the population is in favor of a completely meat-free diet. Um, whether they actually practice it or not is another question, but they are in favor of, you know, uh, uh, aspiring to that. And that, of course, is a kind of big farm, capital intensive, industrial scale veganism that, you know, one is thinking of. It, it, it's, it is not, it is a transformation of the diet, but it's not a transformation of the production system um, necessarily. Um, and that too then leads to a sort of greenwashing of casteism and a greenwashing of racism, um, which I think, you know, poses a tension for us to deal with. And I wonder, you know, if, if you have thoughts to share about that. Sure, Sri Lanka. I mean, but the, the thing about the stigmatization of beef consumption in particular in the Indian context, you know, um, is, is the way in which, you know, populist forces, you know, led by the BJP are using the pandemic, you know, so that they can reinforce this populist agenda, you know, particularly in light of the fact that the response to the pandemic has been so abysmal, but also in light of the fact that, you know, the BJP in power has done an awful job of actually running the economy, even for the capitalists, you know, let alone for workers and peasants. So, you know, when you're doing a terrible job running an economy, and you're doing a terrible job responding to a pandemic, populism then has to find something else, you know, to make, to ensure that political mobilization. And so you have to unpack in the specifics of the Indian case, uh, the way in which populism is tied into the rhetoric of, you know, less meat, which is tied into the Hindavata agenda. Uh, I would want to correct you, Srilata, uh, in one area, and that is, although poultry production in India is not as industrialized as you see it in other countries, it is still largely industrialized now. So urban consumption um, of, of, of poultry is largely driven by factory farms in, in India, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think on the issue of the meat-free diets, you're, you're completely spot on uh, in what you say because it's a particular version of meat-free diets. I make my students look at the labels uh, of these plant-based alternatives uh, just to demonstrate to them the, the extent to which this is just, a, just another version of ultra-processed food. You know, it's just, it is a new profit center as commodification expands which is what the capitalist food regime seeks to do. Open up a new market, expand commodification. Ultra processed is really good because it's more durable. Yeah, it lasts longer, you know. Uh, and in terms of the health aspects of it, you know, again, sodium content is through the roof, you know. So you got to be, you have to be very careful about this. And, you know, when you get a situation where 30% or whatever, in the UK, I hadn't seen that, uh, say that they're in favor of a vegetarian uh, diet. Um, well, the proof is in the pudding. If you want to become a vegetarian, become a vegetarian, then I'll believe it. You know, don't just say you'd like to become a vegetarian, just become it. It's not all that difficult. Um, so uh, that's how I'd respond to that. Um, but the, the, the larger part of the question is that the tensions that are there are largely because of this interface with populism. Uh, and it is true that in the handbook, we don't really have anything on authoritarian populism in rural areas, largely because I think it's 
it's let's call it this way, editorial prerogative. I think characterizing a rural authoritarian populism is really quite fundamentally wrong. And I've said so to those people who introduced the idea of rural authoritarian populism. So, but they keep on talking about it. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll leave it there, especially given the time. Um, great, thank you. So we're almost running out of time. I don't know if you want to take like a final question, just um, the one question that just came in the chat, like just as you sure. were giving this it's answer. entirely up to you, Ingrid. You're, you're the moderator, you decide. Okay, okay. So we'll have one more question and then we'll wrap up and then everyone can go for dinner or lunch, depending on where you are in the world. Except um, we're not going together. I know, I know. <laughs> That's the only downside. Um, so Sipte Hassan Turi writes, um, hello, Haroon, this is Hassan. Uh, my question is, is critical agrarian studies, has it lost interest in studying conflicts? Hmm. No, not at all. Uh, so there's, there's a couple of ways of, of responding to that, that question. Uh, the first one is, uh, that obviously in situations of a large scale conflict, uh, because of the, um, the view of many people uh, in the, the field that they want to be engaged in on the ground research, uh, engaged in research which engages with local communities and learns from them, that in areas of, of, of deep conflict, this can be very difficult to do. Um, you know, having said that, it really is quite remarkable the number of people that still do it uh, uh, in, in various zones uh, around the world, something that I, I wouldn't do, but uh, I certainly know of colleagues who engage in research in zones that I would consider far too dangerous uh, to go and do research in. Uh, the other side of it, however, is in um, thinking about uh, lower level conflict. And lower level conflict very often is revealed when you do more ethnographically focused on the ground uh, research where you learn uh, by doing. Um, you know, one of the things that amazed me in the field work I've been doing for the past four years is the extent to which um, when, you, when you do research in the area of the world that I'm working in now, and you do focus group discussions with women, uh, the ease with which women will speak of the wide prevalence of gender-based violence and how gender-based violence structures their economic and social lives. And of course, gender-based violence is, is an extraordinarily, uh, a perversely common form of conflict around the world. But again, a conflict which is intimate as opposed to a conflict that you see uh, waged between uh, militias or, or, or larger forces. So that, that the, the focus on conflict is, is, I think, in critical agrarian studies, one which is highly rooted in those more intimate relations between actors and trying to understand them uh, in the lived experience. Um, although, as I say, there are people that do uh, work on it uh, in uh, the more uh, larger scale settings. And uh, I did say in my comments that there are things in the handbook that we have not covered despite all the chapters, there are things that are missing and conflict is obviously uh, one of them. There are uh, elements in certain chapters where conflict is addressed, but we could have very well had a standalone chapter that would have been chapter 73 in the revised version. Uh, it's quite a lot. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, so we have to wrap up here, but thank you Haroon and thank you Shilata. This was a really great opening for the seminar series. Uh, and it touched on so many things that we're, our students are talking about, um, you know, all the time. We just started teaching this week, and a lot of it is on environmental issues, global value chains, um, social relations, poverty, uh, UN system, development actors. So this is a very, very relevant, which is great. And then uh, everyone, don't miss the next um, event, which Haroon has endorsed because he's reading the book. So that's great. Um, so that's the one with Howard French, and the book is Born in Blackness. And it's about an economic history from an African perspective and showing how the world history is, you know, has left Africa out of, out of the common narrative. So it's in a way a sister, sister event to the German de Bambra session we had last term, which was on how um, colonialism is left out of social theory. 
Um, so that should be great. Um, so please join us then. And uh, thank you again, Shilata and Harun, and everyone who came and engaged with the um, with, um, questions. Thank you. Thank you.